Frank Jason, you spoke, you talked about smart thinking. I'm here to ask the questions. I have a face for radio. They give you the answers. Uh, so that's the deal. Uh, we got a chunk of time. Um, and I think what we have actually, um, well, a couple of, couple of house rules actually. Uh, looking at your mobile phones is allowed. Uh, we, within reason. Two, um, unlike at the ballroom, we'd like to just keep this as open as possible from a Q&A perspective. We're going to be covering a fairly wide swathe of topics uh, in the market. So if there's anything which is unclear or you'd like to contribute to or even contest, it's pretty much an open house. So we can have a, have a chat. Uh, what we have before us is ex-broadcaster, federation head, ex-McKinsey consultant, entrepreneur in sport and data. Uh, the India's probably first Jerry Maguire, a talent manager, IMG, and now an entrepreneur twice over. Um, I think it's probably just best to sort of jump in um, and, and, and just start by sort of giving a sense. Let's sort of take a, take a, take a tenure view. In the last 10 years, um, one observation, one thing which you've been surprised by pleasantly, and one thing that you've been disappointed by in the evolution of Indian sport. Let's sort of try and set the scene from that perspective and go from there. Um, you want to kick off, Ravi? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll give you the last 23 years, if you like. Um, I he think began when he was six, obviously, so yeah. I think that, you know, IMG, when I was in, IMG got to India first post-liberalization. India opened in 1992, and everyone, or, or many big companies, made a, you know, made a beeline for India. Colgate sell, said, let's sell a billion toothbrushes. You know, Star said, let's get a billion viewers. I mean, it was the holy grail. But I think what, what, what people didn't realize is the day after liberalization, no one had any more money. You know, it's taken a long time for the country to evolve. You know, the five-year-olds then, they're 30 now. They're, that, 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 that's, what, that's what makes India interesting. I think, you know, it was, it, it's taken a while for disposable income to permeate into the system. I always joke, when we started the ATP event in Chennai in the mid-90s, we spent more money printing the tickets than we got in revenue. You know, and now, <laughs> you know, now people are willing to pay to be entertained. I was interesting to hear Samir say on the main stage that Indians do pay. This is one thing. Indians have paid for television from day one. The cable operator may not have paid the principal, but Indians are used to paying for content and for admission and for other things. They've been paying to go into movies for forever. But I always say that India is living four decades at once. You know, we're moving exponentially in some areas. Mobile is a, a great example of that, and incrementally in, in others. Um, but I think, you know, so having been there for a long time, we are entering what will be the defining decade for sports media and entertainment. And, and the reason is, as I said, there's more money in the system. You have a consumer now that has been exposed to the world through media, also through travel. You know, Indians are, I think, amongst the top, top spenders per day, per capita, when they travel. Um, and they're traveling in hordes to all over the world. So to me, it's the most interesting time. And when we do these things, these panels, I always think, okay, what are the people in the, in the room, you know, what's their opportunity in India? And my answer is everything. India is behind the curve in everything. Even if I look at things like the IPL, which is a you know, defining league in terms of, in many ways, and a massive valuation and huge media rights. But if you look, look within the ecosystem, we're so underdeveloped, you know, we, you know, whether it be logistics, infrastructure, PR, technology, and I think that's the opportunity for everyone in the room. Um, selling shovels in a gold rush is, is where the opportunity is. So if you talk about disappointment, I think, you know, like anyone, you know, and certainly, if you know my personality, I want everything to happen yesterday. No, really. But, but yeah, but excitement is what's coming. This is really the decade. And if you want to be part of the India story, now is the time to put your market down. I, I, I sort of say to people that in, in, in many markets, it's about crawl, walk, run. For India now, it's about run, run, run. If, you, if you're ready, go for it now. And I think it'll be a really, really profitable time to build businesses um, in that market. So just to summarize, um, this point early on was, you know, undefined, ill-defined expectation and vastly under-resourced. And then 10, 10 years on, 20 years on, it's much more in terms of the, the demographic dividends going to come in and a confluence of, of different factors. Arvind, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I'll echo a lot of the sentiments that were said, right? 10 years ago, I was a consultant at McKinsey, and we told everyone that was coming into the country that India's at an inflection point, right? You've got the emerging middle class, higher disposable incomes, what's going to happen, right? And in fairness, that kicked in in certain sectors. It certainly didn't in sport. And I think it's just taken a while for it to get there. 
However, the last 18 months have felt like 10 years, right? The pace of change has just been unbelievable, right? And I think digital is a big part of it, right? Um, back then, we used to have this kind of income pyramid of how people go from, you know, strivers, seekers, aspirers, etc. There's a lot of research on it. I think there's a corollary today on just data and digital, which is people have gone from data dark to data beginners to data enabled to fundamentally using digital to change lives. Um, and what's coming with it is access and information. And to me, I'm pleasantly surprised by just, you know, you always think India is going to have that pace of change and you're disappointed by what's going to happen. But the last 18 months or so with Geo, with Hotstar, with YouTube, with best digital, I think, is fundamentally changing the way consumer behaviors are being shaped. Um, and linked to it, I think, there's, there's this old adage that Indians are not price conscious, they're always value conscious, right? You keep hearing that. I don't completely buy into it. But I think there is a mindset that has changed where people are starting to see, OK, um, you know what? I'm willing to pay for this. And I think that's happening at the higher end of the pyramid. And I think it'll be a slower progression for it to happen at a mass scale. Um, but you're starting to see you know, the tenets of it that will eventually bear fruit. So before I come to Yannick, if I could just deep dive again, to what extent do you believe, apart from the distribution, access, data points, reaching, reaching a, a critical mass, to what extent has e-commerce, m-commerce, and the ability to actually pay for things, and therefore the way you actually start looking at, at content as a far more transactional, equal relationship, do you think that's played a part at all, or that's more peripheral at this stage? No, I think it's actually played a big part. And I think it's it's going to play a bigger part going on and on, right? We just Googled it, Google for India, mm. um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. And they talked about the success of Google Taze, that it's called there, and it's now being rebranded Google Pay. And it's a model for emerging markets, right? And then you've got the wallets coming in. Mm. I think that's going to be a big enabler. I don't think it's caused the growth so far, mm. but it's going to be the one that's going to take it further, right? Um, and yeah. the disappointment, I think, is just the infrastructure is not kept up, right? So for actually participating in sport, which is critical to building that sporting culture, yeah. it's just not kept up with the pace you need it for the country. So if you actually want to go out and play a sport, it's incredibly hard in India, right? Having lived in Singapore, having lived in Hong Kong, having lived in the US, like it's really, really hard to actually go out and play a sport in India. It's a probably a pretty useful, suitable segue into sort of what you think, Yannick, and the, and the NBA hat all in particular. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, from a last 10-year perspective, if you look at um, uh, obviously what Ravi and uh, Arvind said in terms of things that have changed drastically and have really impressed a lot of uh, observers from the outside, for me, it's really been, aside from these things, it's really been the uh, uh, consumer mindset change. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the last 10 years and you look at the level of empower empowerment that young, young consumers in India have today, um, the speed in which they adopt uh, you know, new cultures, new new habits is something that has been tremendous in the last 10 years. And that's obviously been supported by technology uh, and the investments in development that has happened around it. Um, I think the impact that that has had on sports or, or sports impact on that uh, from a consumer perspective is very stark as compared to everything else. If you look at Bollywood today, the top five film stars paid are still um, males if you look at just from a male-female empowerment kind of thing, and you look at sport outside of cricket, the top four or five sports people are women. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of empowerment that consumers in India are driving. And I think that sociological change, in which is being driven in youth, mm -hmm. is actually really, you know, it's, the, the impact is beyond sport. It's in media, it's in lifestyle, it's in everything around it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and being part of this industry, I'm thrilled that sport is actually helping drive that industry. If you look at it, even in basketball, right, we do so much of grassroots work. Uh, when we run these grassroots programs across the country with over 50 lakh kids in, there is almost a 50-50 ratio in boys and girls playing the sport in terms of all our uh, grassroots programs. So I think we're seeing that empowerment, especially among, among young children and, and that adoption, which I think is really, really positive for the growth of uh, sport and all media and entertainment business in the country. The challenge, I think the biggest challenge, aside from infrastructure, the biggest challenge has really been the adoption of sports culture uh, among in education. That's something that I think we've been behind. Uh, we've always had a history of um, focus on academics and academic achievement as uh, what everyone aspires to in schools, and sports has <coughs> lagged behind and hasn't got enough of attention. So I think that's something that's being addressed now, uh, both through government and also uh, through private parties like us. And I think that's something that has to change really quickly mm -hmm. to actually build a culture of sport uh, in the country. Just to pick up on that, sort of move to another angle. Um, 
you know, growing up, entering the sports industry 20 years ago, um, we were definitely the exception to the rule. Um, part of it is also pure economics. You know, the, 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 the risk profile of somebody going into sport, you know, the capitalization of a career happens 15 years down the line, very, very sharp pyramid. So they were actually, apart from social reasons, there were actually monetary economic reasons as well. Two questions. One, how much of this empowerment do you believe is actually going to create quality, qualified um, resource in human capital? And could that, like the e-commerce element, also become a self-fulfilling prophecy, whereby all the businesses, as you're saying, now's the time to come into India, you sort of build a business which has gone from, if I remember my sums right, 80 to 90 people to north of 400 in less than four years. Um, you know, we've gone from a franchise sport perspective from the IPL, eight teams, one league, to half a dozen sports scores and 90 franchises. But, you know, it's not necessarily on the match and on the pitch. It's actually the stuff around it which happens. Can we talk a bit more about that and then we come back to digital from that perspective? So more, more at a professional level as opposed to a consumer level. Well, I think, you know, I go back to when we started and, and, and this, this stage is a great example for me. I mean, you, you know, you look at Aravind, Stanford, McKinsey, in the sports business. I could never have attracted a guy like him, you know, many yeah. years ago. In fact, I'm quite happy to say that both these guys started their career at, at IMG. <laughs> and even you were there, indirectly. Thank you, I was the first. But, uh, but I can't take responsibility for anyone's success. But I think what we need are more people like this. And in those days when it started, you're right, they weren't viable careers, you know. You, you're, coming, you're coming from a jobs for life era, yeah. right, and parents and grandparents. I know when I gave up my job as a, as a lawyer, my grandfather told me I was a loser, yeah. right? I mean, straight out, he, I mean, just <laughs> it was straight out, you know. And, and over time, he started to see what we did and realise that this was a, a business. We talk about two different things. You talk about the athletes, and I think, look, whether it's India or US, there's still a huge attrition rate and a massive risk mm -hmm. in, 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 in choosing a professional career. I think the opportunity for India is that because it's been such a cricket-focused market, there are opportunities for athletes to make viable careers in other markets. I mean, look at PV Sindhu. She's, I think, the seventh highest paid woman in the world um, now as a, as a badminton player. So you need more heroes, and, and that'll catalyze growth at the sort of professional playing level. At a industry level, there's no doubt that, you know, um, there are more and more professionals of a different level of qualification looking at sports as a, as a viable career, both at the top, but what you need is in that middle rung. I mean, mm -hmm. you see people like Ipsita Dasgupta from GE coming across to, to Star Sports, mm -hmm. so people moving from other industries. Mm -hmm. You see a migration from FMCG into sports. Uh, Star Sports is a great example of that also. Mm -hmm. So I think sports, media, entertainment, seen as viable careers now. That's been established. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as, as you see more and more qualified uh, people choosing that over engineering or over medicine or whatever, then you know that quality of human capital is going to change vastly and that will impact the, the whole industry. I mean, you, you remember back in the, in the 80s or 90s, every time a TV job came up, it was the same five names. Mm -hmm. That's changing now. But you know, I said these things take time. Also, thankfully, the TV jobs are not coming that often either. Um, can you talk a bit more about hiring from your perspective? NBA and a startup, which has probably gone up, you know, 5x in revenue and 2x in, or 3x in headcount. Yeah, sure. I think, I mean, uh, you know, to, to what, what Ravi said also, I think we are seeing, I mean, the NBA obviously is a global brand uh, which attracts a lot of talent from, from all over the place. But I think from an India perspective, just a sports industry perspective, I see people applying to us from, from work, people who worked 20 years in Hindustan Lever, people who worked in... Uh, you know, we, we have a position that we're actually hiring for now, and we've got uh, senior people from Johnson & Johnson, senior people from, uh, you know, LG, um, from e-commerce, people who are passionate. And I think that's the big advantage that we have in, in our industry, right? It's uh, sports is such a, um, it's, th there's so many people who are passionate about sport. And when you have the opportunity to obviously move, uh, move industry to something that you're really passionate about, uh, it's, uh, I, I think it just attracts talent, the fact that now there is a, um, a clear pathway in terms of a business, in terms of a profession that you can make doing something you, you love. I mean, when I first joined, uh, I mean, Ravi first hired me for, for nothing and he made me work 18 hours a day. Uh, <laughs> at that time, I mean, it was like, you know, I just wanted to work in sport. I mean, I, I was just so passionate about sport. My father was involved in, in sports at that time and that, that gave me a, a, a pathway to it. But at that point of time, there was no one really, I mean, they weren't people interested. I mean, they say, you're working in sport, what are you doing in sport? But that's changed completely now. And I think that's something which, you know, to imagine that it's happened in 15 to 16 years, it's, it's stunning. Yeah. 
If you're only working 18 hours a day, you're slacking off. <laughs> Arvind? I can attest to that, but I won't go into more details. Yeah, but, I think um, the composition of McKinsey for 18 hours a day is a bit different from IMG. But well, we don't, we won't that was that. the norm, right? But um, just talking about that, right? When I first moved into sport about 10 years ago, um, like Yannick said, I think we're very lucky in sport because there's that intrinsic motivation to watch sport or be a part of sport, right? So you'll have a lot of people who will apply. But then the you got to put your money where your mouth is, and sport historically paid a lot less than other sectors. It still does, by the yeah. way, today. But that gap is changing, right? So when I quit uh, consulting to do this, I had to take an 80% hit on my comp, yeah. right? And, but you did it, and now in time it works out. Today what's really exciting as we've grown is you know, we, we really focus a lot on our culture to say this is a place where you get to watch cricket or basketball or tennis every day and you get to work about something you're passionate about, which I think is still the fundamental driver. But suddenly that gap of, hey, if I worked in FMCG and I could make X and here I need to make 30% of that or 40% of that is changing, right? And even we're seeing that just because I think there's more consumption. With more consumption, there's more commercial interest. With more commercial interest, there's more money flowing in. With that, it's a bit of a virtuous cycle. And then, you know, athletes get paid, rights holders get paid, service agencies get paid, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. And so that creates a bit of a, you know, nice little virtuous cycle that's kicking in. And so more and more people can afford to want to come into sport now and follow their passion. It's just an easier decision to make. Okay. Today. So what we're summarizing is there's access at a consumer level to data, to devices, discovery, all that kind of stuff. There's access at a professional level in terms of manpower, it's growing, all that kind of stuff. Let's focus a bit more on, on sort of more the digital sort of revolution, explosion, mobile explosion, which is impacting the business models of the sports industry. I mean, we sort of very much come from the school of thought where it's, it's more around the media rights and the sponsorship rights and to become sort of virtuous cycles. There's obviously a very clear disintermediation uh, from a platform perspective in sport. Where do you see that going, first question? Two, what are the hidden gem gems and emerging opportunities that you believe are going to take off, be your sort of four decades in the next six quarters kind of an opportunity? Look, I, th I think, you know, this disintermediation, disruption, all of that, and I think ultimately, it's got to have a purpose, and that's got to lead to some sort of commercial gain. And I think this, the IPL rights are a great example of that. If you look at the aggregate value of the of the various bids, you know, a phenomenal amount amount of money. I think a lot of that is punt. Right? Mm -hmm. People are not sure. I mean, if you look, take take the broadcast, where there was a clear science behind it, and you know Sony's number was, I think, b bigger than Star's actual number for the broadcast. Yep. I'm right. And then but, but the aggregate pieces put together made Star have a bigger hole. But I think there's a lot of there's, there's a big punt going on. What's clear though so is just to be clear, you punt on the media side, or has that got more science? Is more of a punt media? The, the traditional media, media has media a mass to it. Yeah, but I think the the new media is still. Yep. I think it's a question of everyone's now crossed the question of if, mm -hmm. but the values, it's a question of when. Right? And so are you saying, therefore, just to uh, jump in, is it more formal? Is it more fear of missing out? Yeah, no, I mean, is I it think more opportunity cost rather than value to the business? Yeah, I, is I, that I where think, we I are? Think that's, that, that's been the, that was even the case back in the days with broadcasting. If you look it at, was, which is the evolution of the new media. Look at the Sahara Cup deal back then, $19.6 million over five years, which now is probably the value of a couple of games. And that's what pushed Star and ESPN together, mm. right? Because they were like, we've got to stop this. Mm. I wonder whether that's going to happen at some mm. point because mm. you know, they, they actually stopped the competition, mm. right? Whether, m maybe that will happen, mm. or maybe these guys will all paddle their own canoe mm. in the hope that the values will mm. catch up to, to, mm. to the bids. There's no doubt from a, from a, from a brand perspective, you know, brands are moving away from that you know, just traditional media spend to looking at others. And you can see the distribution of the spends changing almost every day from traditional spends to, to digital. But I, I still think there's an element of the unknown, um, a strong element of the mm -hmm. unknown. Um, there's a migration of pure numbers of people. Everyone's talking about eyeballs and users and all the rest of it. That hasn't translated into the commerce to justify the spends yet. Mm -hmm. But I think it will happen. You know, and I think that you've got a whole new bouquet of um, advertisers as well, you know, mm. from global ones, like mm. the Chinese handset manufacturers, for example, who have pretty much changed the Indian Indian market, you know, to the traditional one. So again, I think I think it's a question of how much it catches up. Mm -hmm. um, it will. Um, and I think that you will find brands from all industries being part of the story. Yeah. Arvind, is digital a new mainstream? Yes, and it's still not fully there, right? So I think digital will be the new mainstream. Let, let's take the market, right? India, not quite, right? Broadcast still has much higher reach, right? So you're not going to get to digital today. But is that in three years or five years or 10 years? 
Um, jury is out on that one. My perspective is sooner rather than later. But I think there are two things that are driving that, right? One is access that we've already talked about, right? There's just more digital penetration so people can actually watch something on their device or cast it or whatever the case may be. But I think what's also changing is consumer behavior, right? Suddenly you've got someone who is happy to sit around and I've got six, seven, eight TV channels and I know you know, I'll, I'm happy to sit around and watch a long game. To just shorter retention spans, I need something quicker, quicker, quicker. So suddenly you're going to have digital experiences that are more interactive, that's going to keep the younger fan engaged. And he or she is then going to be, OK, if a game's going on, how can I do a live prediction? Or how can I chat with my friend? Or how can I do something else? Mm. And that fundamental shift, these two things coupling together, mm. will lead to younger audiences just saying, I need a more interactive experience. Mm. Now, whether that's TV is able to adapt and make it smart TV and it'll make that interactive experience mm. come to life, or really it's going to be digital that's going to be the way to do it, mm. I think is going to fundamentally change the way people consume sport. Live sport will still be the big driver, right? Because that's where the action is. Shoulder content can exist to an extent. But the, the live sport viewing experience will change, and I think digital is going to be the one that's going to make that change happen. Yannick, yeah, from an international federation perspective, from an international sports league perspective, uh, in a market which is quite variegated, you know, there's Indian metros, B towns, A towns, gender's an issue, smart television, smart device. How do you how do you look at digital as a medium to engage for participation, for recreation, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think you know for, for us we look at uh, digital is just a tremendous opportunity in the market, yeah. and I think the biggest opportunity that it plays is it allows us to understand our fan or consumer better. Today, the biggest challenge that you have as a, as, you know, as a global sports brand is uh, in, in, in lots of part, you're a B2B, com you're, you're a B2B product, right? You're, you're talking, there's a gatekeeper who's a linear broadcaster who's talking to consumers. You're relying on a third party agency, which is Bach in India, Nielsen in the US, to give you data about your consumers. The opportunity on digital is the ability to understand and know your consumer better and build that relationship with them. I mean, today in, in, um, in India itself, we have 7 million followers on, uh, on Facebook. And you know, when you, we are able to dissect the data, look at you know, 4.5 million of those followers under the age of 22, we're able to understand which city they come from, whether they come from Jaipur or from Mizoram, we're able to understand what their habits are, how can we actually, by knowing them better, how can we serve them better? How can we get them more deeply engaged as a consumer? And obviously, in the, in, in, the, in the mid to long term, how can you then more efficiently monetize them? <coughs> and I think that's, those are the two key things that we kind of look at uh, you know, as a global sports league, as the opportunity in India, is that we are getting to know our consumers so much better than we ever had the opportunity to. Mm. And I think that's really the big opportunity for us from digital, the ability to talk to our consumer directly, uh, customize our product to make sure that the consumer is getting the best experience Could you give possible. An example in the Indian context, or yeah, I mean, for, yeah. For example, we we do uh, social media posts in three languages, uh, and then they are you'll be able to target them instead of going to three different broadcasters, uh, regional broadcaster in Tamil Nadu, a uh, uh, GEC in uh, in in the uh, Hindi speaking markets, and a Bengali broadcaster. We are able to target it through social media specifically to audiences who want that content. So there's no spillage. So you put that on Sony 6, which is a national sports network, everyone gets it. You know, 95% of the consumers who watch it saying, you know, you know what, what are you putting Tamil content on for it? So digital allows you to address consumers directly. And I think we are seeing the engagement levels that we see, for example, in Tamil content we put on social is uh, in, in Tamil Nadu, is in, in Chennai, for example, is 25 times more than what they interact in, in English content. And, you know, India being such a diverse market, I think digital has completely moved the needle in terms of the opportunity. Mm. Uh, sports leagues and sports pro you know content owners need to be able to appreciate that and stop you know relying on third party ratings and stuff and appreciate the fact that knowing your consumer better should drive what your product needs to be in, and mm -hmm. customize that and that's something that we've been very focused and conscious on in doing let me ask a question to both of you in terms of the application of digital of uh, for to create value monetary following engagement whatever the case might be and you deal with international brands, you know, FIFA, UEFA, ICC, all that kind of stuff. You deal with domestic uh, franchisees, broadcasters as well. Um, or you, you probably get a playbook from New York as well saying this is what actually works around the world for us, not just in Anglophonic markets, but other markets as well. Question, are you finding there's more than an increased frequency of a very uniquely Indian way of using digital to engage fans for certain segments, or that's not happened so far? 
In terms of content? In terms of, yeah, using digital, whether it's data, whether it's, I think language is one example. Whether right. it's data, whether it's video, whether it's audio, because it's you know, late, low data consumption. Right. You know, that, whether it's GIFs oh, as absolutely. opposed to videos, you know, which is very peculiarly emerging market oriented. Absolutely. I think India is an extremely unique market. I mean, language is obviously and regional, um, you know, regional food habits, regional consumption habits. I mean, if you look at the, the number one television show uh, in, in Calcutta, you will, there will be no one who watches Hindi content who will believe that that's the number one show. The, the, the style of the show, the way it's presented, uh, you know, how big or how loud it is. Look at Tamil Nadu. I mean, you look at today, you know, Bollywood movies, one of the highest rated, um, you know, uh, one highest rated movie channels or, or movies which go on, uh, on Hindi movie channels are Tamil Nadu or South Indian movies dubbed in Hindi because mm -hmm. Hindi, the Bollywood movies have started becoming more urban centric. And if you look at going to villages and the rural areas, they're still looking for the big, loud, flying cars, you know, Superman kind of movies, which uh, South India is producing. So you have, I mean, it, the, the, the consumption, the way various consumers consume content and the type of, you know, the taste they have is completely different across the country. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the good thing about us being this, this, you know, this content creator as the NBA is that we have the opportunity to almost provide something for everyone in the way we actually present it. And that's, that's what we're doing a lot of work on. Arvind, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, and link to it, I think it's, for, uh, for us, I think we're seeing three things, right? The first is exactly what Yannick mentioned in terms of content. And again, that content goes deeper than just translating it, right? Like UC Browser is a great example of an app where the content that's in English is in English, but the articles that show up when you change it to Hindi is not just the same articles, but it's fundamentally different pieces of content, right? One might show more cricket and basketball and talk about you know analysis of the day's plays. The others might have a bit more of a sensational headline, which is going to get the user in there. Right? So I think the ability to almost split that content to different fans and then tailor it much, much more at a massive scale, right? but across 10, 15 different personas is one big one. Right? Um, the second where I think India will catch up is just data consumption, and mm. um, that's changing, yeah. right? And it's changed in the last year, but you know, lower res videos, starting to do more audio content, picture galleries, for instance, do much better than videos in India than it did in other markets, right? Literacy. Just because of that. Literacy is a big part of it, right? So that's kind of the second big thread. And the third, which I was going to touch upon, was a combination of mobile and video, mm. just because of literacy being you know, not prevalent all the way through, because you're suddenly getting new users coming online for the first time on mobile. Mm. So I think the world is moving to more mobile-friendly mm. content, mm. India more so, mm. um, where it's critical to get that right, to get the user experience right. Um, and if you're not doing multi-language, how do you do content that goes beyond, right? And mm. uh, I saw a cool presentation that said, video is new English, right? Or video is the new language. Uh, which may have I'm, been I'm, gonna, I'm gonna charge you for that. Exactly. Uh, thank that, you. That's exactly um, right. Uh, Robbie, you know, you've been around Indian boardrooms. Yeah. You know, you've been around IMG boardrooms all over the world. Exactly the nuance, detail, sophistication that Yannick and Arvind have just spoken about in terms of what's required to have as the real opportunity. What are the kind of conversations, what are the kind of questions, queries that you get when speaking to, you know, senior sort of leadership, captains of industry, what's the known unknown for them, which is the most frequent? Let me put it that way. I mean, it depends on what boardroom you're in, but if you're in the boardroom... Let's say Indian large family-owned promoter-driven conglomerates. That's well, one large part of our economy. Well, I, and again, they're in so many different businesses, but if I take, I take a step back and, and, and you know, I reflect on what these guys have been saying, I think the big question is, or the big thing everyone's trying to take advantage of, catalyze, is convergence, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, you talk about sportainment. You know, how do you attract broader audiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, you know that the, historically the predominant audience for test cricket is male, right? The, the, the IPL was created to bring more people mm -hmm. to cricket and it's done that, right? Female fans, younger fans who perhaps have been migrating towards international football, etc. Then the next question is how do you how do you monetize those? And I think that's that's the real thing that you know I think is, is really interesting for, for everyone. It's it's how you it's 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 ultimately storytelling in a way to bring people back in. I think that's what the digital platform involves. Historically I I'm I'm gonna answer your question in a nonlinear fashion as a reflection as keeping with as a reflection times. conversation. Okay, fair enough. But if you ask yourself how do you in in a in a broadcast only environment it was the game and there was highlights. Right? But now you can get behind the scenes. And if you look at what's Googled most after celebrities, it's their families. Right? So for example, you can now still t tell stories around the wife and the kids and the girlfriend maybe as well. Um, or both actually. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, so all of a sudden you can attract 
a much broader audience, yeah. and then you can monetize that further. Yeah. And I think that's what is a really interesting thing for for these guys. Yeah. To bring more people into the into the game, yeah. um, and 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 for anyone who's commercially interested in the sport, whether it and whether it be a broadcaster or a brand or a family. You talk about the families that are buying teams, etc. I mean, one of the great challenges for the Indian families that are all now going and buying franchises is how do we create loyalty, right? You I mean. Eight, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, there were no IPL teams in cities and everyone's second favourite team was the team that Sachin played for. And now everyone's second te favourite team is the team that you know Virat plays for. But there's no real city loyalty. How do you create all of that? So all of these questions, uh, 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 I think, will be answered by digital, mm -hmm. right? Because it gives a chance to tell, tell a story that goes beyond the game you know, and, and the highlights. And I think that's what everyone's trying to crack. And then there's a cross pollinization between industries. I mean, this, this very conference is a great example. I mean, you know, five years ago or whatever, it was all different conferences over different times. And they've brought it all together, together. Under, under one banner, yeah. which has been great, great for all of us because yeah. of the convergence. Robin's think, definitely got to get invited back next year. That, that, that's very clear. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that's, that's what I was pumping for. Um, but I think, you know, I mean, I'll tell, I'll tell a sort of a, an old story as, a, as an example, and I think this is. Actually, you need to hurry up because I just want to throw it to the audience in case. Uh, then I won't, then I won't tell it. You go. Yeah. It's a uh, good just story, though. Uh, any questions from the audience? We've got about three or four minutes left. Um, can we just break into that if that's okay? A gentleman in the front, could you just, uh, just shout loud, please, and go for it? Okay, I have two questions. Turn, uh, you can face them. We'll listen to you. Carry on, carry on. I'll get the mic. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have two questions. The first question to Yannick. I've been a basketball fan. Uh, for the last 20 years, and I've seen basketball broadcast evolve in India as well. Like Star Sports used to probably show a Friday, Saturday game, and now it's moved on. But I think that's one thing that's not changed is the timing of basketball. Uh, let's uh, let's be very practical in India. If you're not putting on devotional or news in the morning, then there's no TV. So how does uh, NBA change that? How how how's the acceptance of basketball, especially the viewership, changed? Uh, in the last few years, considering most of the games are at 5.30. And <coughs> second question to the Could overall. You give, that, give the audience a chance. We've got three minutes. So let me answer that question first. Okay. And depending on time, we'll come back. Sure. Yeah? Thank sure. you. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the, 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 there are two answers to the question. One is obviously we look at uh, being in the morning, which is 5.30, 9, depending on where the games are running, as an opportunity, right? You don't, you're not competing with any other sports products. So we've seen that grow. And we had 80 million people tune into NBA programming across last season. So we've seen that opportunity. The opportunity to keep them more engaged in live programming is something that we have to keep working on. Uh, we obviously use shoulder programming on social, which keeps people on throughout the day. The second thing that we've done as an organization, and you know, we've seen great results, is we've started playing games in the US for India. So last year, we had uh, five teams on the East Coast play at, uh, in the afternoon on Sundays, on five Sundays in a row, so that they went prime time in India. And we had tremendous response. But you know, that's, that's a marketing solution where you get people to sample the product and hopefully convert them to fans to watch the core product during. But we keep doing things like that, keeping those things in mind. And you know, we've seen China, where our viewership is, is in the millions, where the game is also on during, in the morning. So if you can build a fan base, consumers will come. But we need to create, the, create that fan base, which is what we're focusing on. I guess a follow on to that is uh, watching live telecast is no longer a house, home, television-bound activity which sort of changes dynamics as well. Any other questions in the audience before I go back to the gentleman in the front? Is there a question in the back? No. Okay. Uh, can we have the mic in front, please? Thank you. Uh, don't you think there's over-involvement of Bollywood uh, when it comes to all the new sports uh, and all the new franchises? Uh, and a simple example is the ISL. I mean, to a lot of urban Indians like us who are not into Bollywood, it can be a little annoying. Uh, let's uh, let. I mean, the most important thing about sports is uh, sports is all about loyalty, and I don't think there is any in Bollywood. So, uh, do you think that we can do away with that, or is Bollywood still going to be a very important platform to push all the sports onto I, mainstream? I'll let the man who used to manage Shane Warne answer that, and that's pretty. Good. Um, look, I think they're probably. I understand the perspective. I think Bollywood has added a lot. To, to the various sports, no doubt. Do some, do some franchises or some sports overdo it? Of course. Um, the involvement of celebrity in global sport is not just peculiar to India. Jack Nicholson's been sitting in the front row of the Lakers for forever, right? And, and, and many others. Uh, I think, you know, like I said, it's, it's a question of, of usage. I think what I, you know, 
I think ultimately it's about the sport on the pitch, and that will always be the case. I think that's why kabaddi has succeeded so well because it's quality kabaddi. You know, it's been it's, it's been um, dressed up very nicely, but it's still quality sport. If the sport's no good, it doesn't matter how many people are dancing and singing and jumping around; it won't make a difference. Um, but I certainly so I think it can be it can be the icing. It certainly shouldn't be the cake. Um, but I think it's also helped certain sports get off the ground, you know, and, and, then, and then those sports have to continue on the back of being credible sports or they won't last. Notwithstanding the fact that India has launched 14 leagues since the IPL, some have already stopped, right? Because, they, because, they, because it wasn't great sport. So the sport needs to be good. But I think it's, it's one of the unique things uh, about India, the, the, the involvement of celebrities at the front end. What I, I'll give you an example of where I think it's overused. The first final of the ISL the broadcaster promoter is a battle between Sachin and Saurav. Now, to me, that was too much because ultimately it's got to be between the two teams, right? And I think that's where it probably goes. And that, that, was, that wasn't even Bollywood. That was two cricketers. But I think that's, that will change as the ISL evolves. That, won't ha that wouldn't happen now. It happened then. So sometimes it's the catalyst to get it off the ground. It's funny you say that, you know, you, you know you're, you're not from India and you don't love Bollywood. I, I'm a first-generation migrant in Australia and I didn't really care much about Bollywood. I look at the th third and fourth and they know more about Bollywood than the people in Bollywood. So I think it's horses for courses a little bit, but I certainly think it's more of an enhancer than it is a detractor. Okay, you want to add to that? You're good? Okay, uh, that's all we have time for. If I can give you the audience, Yannick, Arvind and Ravi. Thank you very much. <laughs>